Well, I'm speaking today is Norman McLean. Uh, yesterday I googled him to check my facts for this introduction. And I was a bit alarmed when Google informed me of the following. People also ask, is Norman McLean still alive? <laughs> <laughs> when did Norman McLean die? And where is Norman McLean married? Oh, God. Well, digging a bit deeper, I discovered that he died in 1990 in Chicago. <laughs> and that he was professor of English literature, and that he wrote A River Runs Through It, which was turned into a film starring Brad Pitt. So I was very pleased when actually Norman turned up today. <laughs> Norman is, of course, emeritus professor in genetics at Southampton University, chairman of Southampton Humanist and a patron of Humanist UK. He's very much alive, and today he's going to talk to us about the human brain. So please give a fantastic welcome to him. Yes, hopefully this is going to work. Let's just do a little sound check on this, shall we? Yeah. Okay. So no, that should be separate. So let's just... I can't go over. Yeah, it's sticking out there. No, no, no. No. Well, I'm sure uh, is he talking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That doesn't, doesn't appear to be... Uh, I don't think it should be against the chief. I think something's happened to the position. Sh shall, we, shall we just revert to the old fashioned one? Yeah. Should we revert to this one now? Yeah. It doesn't, I don't know why it's not working, but it's not. It is switched on, is it? No, 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 I don't mean that, I mean the. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It's a bit better, but not great. Into this network. 
And then as well as neurons, you have in the brain other cells, called glial cells, and they're there in a supporting role to help the neurons to work properly. And I'll mention later the, the existence of this partial barrier, which we call the blood brain barrier. I thought it would be amusing to start off by looking at the way the Egyptians modified the dead pharaohs and so on. And what they did was that they would have separate jars into which they placed, you can see the intestines, the stomach, the lungs, the liver, and so on. And what they did with the brain, they scraped it out and threw it away. Because they didn't think it was of any significance. So it took little time for people to realize that the, the brain was where it was all made to happen. So I thought I would talk in, in the following way, that I'll talk about the human brain and compare it with other brains, and talk about the two sides of the brain. I've said there the physical base of the memory. There are a lot of, of unknowns about how the brain works, and memory is maybe the chief unknown. So I'll talk a little bit about what the assumptions are about how memory works. And then I'll, I'll mention brain surgery, <coughs> neurological disease, and end up with what I call the brain in extremis. So glial cells are just these additional cells in the brain. They take up about two-thirds of the bulk. Uh, so most of the brain is made up of glial cells. And then they have an unfortunate tendency to become malignant. So you'll often hear of people who have glioblasts. And these are tumors of the glial cells in the brain. And they are uh, somewhat commoner than uh, uh, the tumors of the, of the neurons themselves. And then I might mention here, I think I come on to the, in a moment, the blood brain barrier. Uh, so the association between glial cells and neurons is it here in the neuron, and this bit of the neuron is called the axon, and these would be dendrites that would form synapses with other neurons, and then these are glial cells, which are stuck on to the neurons and seem to help them to work. This is not a complete barrier, but it seems that in evolution, it's been important to ensure that bacteria and viruses do not find their way into the brain. Uh, and so there is a partial barrier. So the blood is monitored on its way to the brain to try and ensure that infectious agents don't get there. As you can imagine, it's not, it's not proved to be 100% foolproof. And we, a few years ago, we were very concerned about mad cow disease affecting people's brains. So that was something that actually got through the blood brain barrier. I don't want to labor the structure of the brain, but I thought I would just chat with you about it. Of course, the spinal cord runs in and uh, joins the bottom of the brain. At the back of the brain, there is this section called the cerebellum, which is very much involved with balance. And when you get to my age, your cerebellum may not work perfectly well, and so your balance is not as good as it was when you were younger. And then the, the cerebral hemispheres are together called the cerebrum, and it's divided up into different sections. Um, and of course it's divided the left and the right sides of the brain. The, the surface of the cerebral hemispheres is referred to as the cerebral cortex. And that seems to be a good indication of intelligence. And so if you look at the brains of other animals, other than humans, you'll find they've got a cerebral cortex, but it's nothing like as extensive. If you spread out our cerebral cortex, it would occupy an area of about a square meter in extent, because it's very convoluted. Um, and if you look at other animals, they have smoother uh, cortices, uh, it seems to represent a, a good indicator of how clever they are. And then there are a couple of glands in the brain that it's important to mention. One is the pineal gland, which is down here, and that's a, a tiny series of cells that releases 
melatonin, which regulates our diurnal rhythm, our day night break, um, the, 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 the fact that we go to sleep late in the evening and we wake in the morning. So it's to some extent affected by light. And many people of, of my vintage, if the pineal becomes a bit lazy and doesn't secrete enough melatonin, and so it's uh, it's a quite available in the market, and quite a few people take it uh, to help them to go to sleep. So I mean, we don't need to go into much detail here, but the different lobes of the brain have different functions. So some are concerned with vision, some are concerned with hearing, and some are concerned with with sense, uh, spatial sense. As well as the pineal, there is another thing called the pituitary. And it has, it has the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. And they secrete quite a number of different hormones. And you'll see that these hormones are important in birth, for example, uh, and they, they uh, also secrete steroids and growth hormone. So both of these little tiny little glands in the brain are quite important in human development. Now here's one of the great questions about the brain is how memory works. I mean we all are aware that we have different kinds of memory. We have what we call short-term memory and sometimes that becomes more established and becomes long-term memory. But the more you think about it, the more you realize that it's actually the most important thing that your brain has to do is to forget. Because if you didn't forget, if you remembered everything you had at every meal over the past month or so, your brain would be full of all this jumbled information, which is totally useless. So one of the most crucial things about brain activity and memory is that you should get rid of a lot of the stuff which is unimportant and simply retain as memories uh, things that are going to be valuable. And it's fairly unclear how that selection process works. Clearly, what happens around an event often affects how permanent it becomes. So if we have a, a crash in the car, uh, it, it may be a perspective of our lifetime, a small incident, but a lot of emotion is often expended, and so you remember each minute that was involved in the car accident. Uh, so the, the context of a memory has a lot to do with its retention. Um, and of course, there are, there's a curious fact that some things we choose to forget, and it becomes uh, an adaptation to forget something that's inconvenient or embarrassing to us. Uh, so memory has this aspect that it's partial and what is retained uh, is to some extent filtered. The, the memories are stored in different places. There are two particular places called the amygdala, which is down here at Hippocampus. Hippocampus is a Latin name for a seahorse. And it was called that because it was thought to be shaped a little bit like a seahorse. But some of our memories are stored in the neurons of the amygdala and the hippocampus, as well as in the frontal cortex. So it's not all stored in one place. And that's something that's been very difficult for behavioral scientists, because they often work with people who've had accidents where they lost this of their brain. And it seems that often these people's memories are intact, despite the fact they've lost quite a lot of the neurons uh, that one assumes were involved. And so memory <coughs> seems to be in different places. The same memory can be retained in different parts of the brain. So you can lose a bar apart and still not lose the memory. So there's still a lot of puzzles about the physical uh, aspects of memory. It's assumed that at its base, it, a memory would consist of a series of neurons linked together by synapses and having an electric current which goes round 
and the, the current between these adjacent neurons would be the established memory. And so for each memory that we have, as it were, there will be in our brain at least one of these circuits. But that's very much an assumption, and the amount of proof that exists for that is somewhat limited. I think I'll go on now and talk about the relationship between our brain and our muscles, because this is called the motor skills, and so our brain is involved in enabling us to walk or swim or play games and so on. And if you ask how the, how the brain connects with the muscle and instructs it about what to do, it's done chemically. So if this is the base of the neuron, the neuron releases molecules of what is called acetylcholine. And they pass down and settle on the surface of the muscle and enable the muscle to start contracting. So the neuromuscular junction is not a tight junction, it's a loose junction <coughs> across which these molecules of acetylcholine are able to travel. And of course, we know that our nervous system extends throughout our body, and so the brain is in touch with all the different parts of our body, and so even if somebody touches our toe, we're aware of it because the electrical signals travel uh, throughout the nervous system. Some neurons are incredibly complex. Um, the basic structure of a neuron is that here is the long axon, but the, it's actually interrupted by what are called swan cells, and they surround the neuron and then there are gaps. And so the electrical impulse that passes along is pulsed. And that's partly because of the actions of the swan cells. Uh, and then the, it, if this axon is linked on to that of another nerve cell, the, the electrical signal will pass from one neuron to another. And here's an example of what is called a Purkinje cell. It's just one of the more complex of the neurons in the brain. And uh, so you, you have to imagine this structure with so many um, connections between adjacent neurons, which make up something which is slightly resembling this. So you would have uh, layers and layers of neurons attached to other neurons. And within this, there will be structures that we would refer to as a memory. I alluded to the fact that it's quite interesting to look at the brain of other animals. And here, for example, is the skull and brain of human and the skull and brain of a chimp. And you can see that the cerebral cortex of the chimp is much less extensive than it is uh, in our case. And here's the cerebellum down here. But it's, it's slightly unsettling to compare a human brain with that of the whales, because we find that they have very convoluted uh, and very elaborate cerebral cortex. So our nearest rivals in terms of intelligence are certainly not the apes, but they're the whales. Now, why whales have become so smart, it's quite hard to understand. But it's assumed to be partly because when they adapted to swim in the sea, they became streamlined, and so they lost their facial features. They couldn't communicate with one another by the look of their face. And so they developed language. And whales, like ourselves, seem to be dependent on sound to communicate together. And the sound of whales can travel up and be over maybe 100 miles of ocean. So whales can hear one another even in very long distances. But whether all of that explains just why whales have developed such complicated brains, I think is a still an open question. And then I've alluded to the fact that of course the brain is, the brain is split. And you're probably all aware of the fact that you occasionally get uh, people who accidentally have a split brain that they connections between the left and the right side have been lost. And when these people 
people are in hospital, they literally don't know the right hand doesn't know what their left hand is doing. So they'll be reaching for a book with their right hand, but doing something quite different with their left hand. And the two sides uh, are not able to communicate. But in most of us, the communication between the two sides is quite evident. We often refer to the left side of the brain as being more developed in the male. And so you find that qualities like abstract thought and mathematics, your science and math and so on, are highly developed. And if you, and I'll come on later and talk about neurological symptoms, but if you think of, of somebody with autism, for example, which is quite common in men, then you find that the, their behavior emphasizes the left side of the brain. Whereas the so-called right side um, has a number of qualities which we often associate with women rather than men, creativity, intuition, insight, and so on. And of course, the two sides work in, in a diametrically different way. So the left side is what controls the right hand side in our motor skills, and vice versa. So there's a split. And the same is true of our visual cortex, isn't it? But we have a so-called optic chiasma in our brain. So our right eye is controlled from the left side of the brain, and our left eye is controlled from the right side of the brain. So there's, there's quite a lot crossover. If you look at the brain of a fish, it's quite entertaining and interesting because you find that it's very simplified, but it has certain Fish are able to do something supremely well. The sense of smell is very good, and so they have a large olfactory bulb. And they also, their vision is much better than ours, uh, and so they have a large optic lobe. Whereas the cerebellum itself is relatively small. Uh, so the brains of, of different animals often tell us things about their lifestyle. We're all familiar with the fact that, uh, that people can now perform amazing operations on human brains. And in fact, back in Southampton, the, the talk we're having tomorrow night is being given by a friend of mine who's a brain surgeon, and he's talking about advances in uh, neuroscience in terms of brain surgery. Um, and so there have been a lot of developments now. Uh, one of them is that during the operation, the surgeon is able to visualize the parts of the brain through magnetic imaging. And often they can stimulate it to see what effect the operation is having. So they're not totally working in the lungs of the brain. So now I thought I would come on and think about quite a few problems that we have with our brain. One of them, I think we're all aware that as you get older, you're more at risk of stroke. And of course, these can be minor, the so called transient ischemic attacks, which may only last for a few seconds or a minute. Or it may be major, you may have uh, an aneurysm in your brain, a, 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 a weakness in the blood vessel, where something breaks and you bleed into the brain, and you may then have a major stroke. And it's all too common. Uh, as you get over 50 or 60, uh, that you do have a stroke. And the pressure now is on to try and get people hospitalized as quickly as possible so that uh, the, the surgeons can do what they can to remove any blood that's there and so on. And then here, I've listed autism, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, epilepsy uh, is an inherited disease and affects often young people, uh, although some people don't develop it until middle age. There is fairly satisfactory medication. The problem is persuading epileptic people to continue to take the medication, but it makes them rather sleepy, and they feel inefficient. And so it's a temptation to them to stop taking it. But if they stop taking it, then they'll have recurrent epileptic fits. Uh, 
Um, and so epilepsy is a, a an electrical problem of the brain, that parts of the brain go into spasm. One of the most horrible diseases of all age is motor neuron disease, where some of the neurons affecting the muscles become defective. It's really a problem of the lining of the axons, the covering of the axons. Uh, many of you here will have suffered in the past from migraine and maybe still do so. And that puzzled people for a long time. It's characterized by usually a single-sided headache, but some people have visual symptoms and you can lose the ability to speak. Uh, and so, so migraine is actually a systemic situation the whole body is affected. And if you suffer from migraine, you probably learn that by the time the migraine attack has become established, it's too late to take medication because your gut has shut down and no longer absorbs anything. And so it's been quite difficult for people with migraine to have an effective uh, treatment for it. Quite a lot of what we call depressive illness is now regarded as a bipolar disease where people oscillate between being depressed and being rather high. And it's not very it's not really under their control. And so the periodicity of this may vary from weeks to months. Um, they're normally now treated with cognitive therapy or with medication. But bipolar depressive disease is, is really quite common in the population. Parkinson's disease is largely a disease of old age. And I'm sure you know people who it often begins with a tremor of the hand and a slightly shuffling gait. And eventually your facial features are no longer as pliable as they should be. So people with Parkinson's have a, a somewhat fixed stare. You may remember Muhammad Ali, the boxer, developed Parkinson's disease in his old age. And of course we're all only too aware of Alzheimer's, which interferes uh, with our concentration and our memory, and it impairs the quality of life of an old age. I don't think I need to labor this, this is just some details about epilepsy. I said it's commonest in childhood, but sometimes occurs in people over 60. And Parkinson's disease is because it's is still unknown. There's quite an effective treatment with dopamine, but uh, really the medics try not to start the treatment too early because it's only effective for a few years. And so they often wait until the Parkinson's is reasonably developed before they'll start the treatment. And this is just a little view of migraine. You'll see it one in every five women and one and every 15 men will suffer from migraine. It's often greatly underestimated. I used to have migraine once a week, and I don't know too well how debilitating it was, but I'm not sure I've grown it up this time. And characteristically, people with migraine see these curious visions uh, of kind of broken up images in their eyes, and that often characterizes migraine. Oliver Sachs, whose name I'm sure you know, who's an American and partly British psychiatrist, uh, wrote a book about migraine, and he suffered from it. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, you can see changes in the brain. You get what are called fibrillary tangles, so the synapses become confused, and then you have depositions of what is called tau protein. It's still, I mean, we have a group at Southampton University working on Alzheimer's, and it's still not at all clear uh, how these changes come about or what controls them. And I thought I would just end up by commenting on some of the, the strange things that our brain does in different situations, such as sleep. So if you look at the function of the brain, our brains, of course, are not entirely inactive during sleep. And it's astonishing how creative 
our dreams can be. I mean, most people dream in color, and you can often have uh, a story and a dream which you never encountered in life. So there's a lot of creativity. Uh, and all this is, comes about with the, the brain when you're asleep. Of course, it's less active than it would be during the day. And one of the most curious things about uh, the brain is what happens with people with profound autism. And often these are, are young people, when it's first recognized, you can read all the books of this man called Stephen Wiltshire, uh, who had a passion for drawing buildings in London. Uh, usually enough, when he drew them, they were always back to front. Uh, and eventually they took Stephen Wiltshire up in a helicopter and flew him over London City and let him live at the, uh, at the, the city. And then when he landed, they gave him a huge sheet of paper and asked him if he'd like to draw a map of what he'd seen. Well, if you and I had done that, we'd probably start off by trying to draw the Thames and the House of Parliament or something. He didn't do that at all. He started off in one corner and put in all the detail of all the streets and buildings and just gradually it spread out. So he saw the whole of London in one image. Uh, so Hugh Casson, the artist, eventually took on another his way and he's now published quite a number of books uh, and you can buy drawings and paintings by Stephen Culture. Kim Peek, who was made into a film of Rain Man, was another person. I mean, the, the word savant really means kind of genius. So these are people with a limited genius who are also autistic. And Kim Peek had memorized about 12,000 different books. And, uh, and he could read, when he read a book, he could read the right and the left hand side at the same time. So his brain had this astonishing hyper development of certain abilities. And then there was a woman in France who was born blind but had an amazing memory for music and she could play uh, uh, a lot of music on the show. So we learn quite a lot about the function of the brain by looking at the lives of some of these uh, people. This is one of Stephen Wiltshire's drawings. Uh, I don't know actually what this is, but it's one of the buildings in London. And here is, uh, there's a book called Islands of Genius, which I have at home, or maybe you should have brought it with me, by this guy Trevor. And he talks about autistic savants. This is Kim Peek reading this book. And he would read two or three books a day. So he had this kind of compulsive desire to assimilate the information from books into his brain. And here is um, one of my heroes, Rene Oliver Sacks. Um, he, he sadly died some years ago, but he was fascinated by the relationship between body and brain. And he came to develop a theory which, about hallucinations. He became persuaded that normally in the brain we see or hear things, and they're taken up into our brain, and then the vision of what we see leads to an action on our part. But he concluded that there's also an electrical impulse that goes the other way. And so we start off in the neurons and go out through your, through your eyes or ears, and you would have an experience which was unreal. You'd have a hallucination. You'd be persuaded that something had happened, but it was actually an aberration of your brain that led to the vision that you had. And of course this has been used to account for uh, things like uh, Muhammad composing the Quran and so on, that he was in the dark age during that period and was almost certainly hallucinating. And it's led to all kinds of strange uh, things in human nature. Uh, he, called, he wrote a book called Musical Philia because all of our sex became sufficiently celebrated that a lot of people with strange mental conditions in America would seek him out 
and asked his advice. And many of these people had very strange musical experiences. Um, some of them, uh, after they, they had a shock, they would hear a tune endlessly playing uh, in their brain. It's not about his first story in musical trivia is about a guy who was struck by lightning in the States and he was quite badly burned. But after he recovered, he had a mania for playing the piano and he wanted to, to, to do this all the time. And eventually his wife left him because she couldn't bear to have the piano played all the time. But he became absolutely obsessed with producing music on the piano. So music seems to have a strange relationship with personality in many people uh, who have slight uh, problems with their brain. Uh, so he called them hallucinations and music. Well, that is it. And uh, I hope that my little chat with you has encouraged you to think a bit more differently about what you've done upstairs. <laughs>
each group of animals has evolved in different ways. And you find that, say, the brains of fishes or birds or amphibians have got different aspects exaggerated because they often, I mean, a bird, for example, with its ability to fly, you find that the parts of the brain that are involved uh, with flight are very exaggerated. Uh, one of the remaining huge mysteries about brain activity involves migration, about how things like birds or turtles or even migratory fish like salmon are able to determine where they are and how they can re-navigate. And there are a lot of astonishing stories about migration. One of the first ones was uh, an experiment done by Michael Lockley, who worked uh, on uh, the island of Stockholm, and it had a population of shearwaters which nest on the ground. And they normally overwinter in the South Atlantic. What he did, he caught two of these shearwaters and put a number of rings on their legs and gave them to a friend of his who was traveling to Boston by air. And he took them over to Boston and then traveled into the central states and released these birds. And of course, they were thousands of miles out where they would normally be. But they were back in their burrows before the letter arrived telling the guy that he had been, they were released. So you know, migration remains one of the huge unknowns about how animals do it, how they use their brains to do it. It's the Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, one of the conditions you didn't mention of brain problems was something that I've been diagnosed with 40 years ago, which was multiple sclerosis. Oh, yes. And I not only have problems with my arms and legs, but cognitive symptoms, yes. short term memory and balance. I mean, I'm very lucky. Um, I'm in my 70s now, and I know some people who have a condition very seriously, uh, sometimes progressive, so they have a shadow over their head, knowing that they're going to get worse and worse, and there's nothing. Yes, I sure have. They're trying to get out of drugs. Yeah, that's very interesting to, to know, because uh, it starts off with a mutation in one particular protein, doesn't it? And this protein mm -hmm. affects. Yeah, protein affects a lot of your function uh, and becomes eventually a kind of systemic disease. Protein, you know, that word seems to figure a lot in medical things nowadays and it didn't seem to be mentioned before. But protein no. seems to come well, I mean, if you, if you think about the developments in molecular biology, our genes, uh, when they're active, the, the thing they make is protein. And the proteins often work as enzymes, which are kind of catalysts, which can do a lot of jobs around the body. So you're right, a lot of the symptoms of genetic malfunction is found in the way the proteins behave. I mean, you can, you can visualize a protein um, as, as, it's had, as a long chain, which is folded up in a convoluted way. Folding of the chain, which gives a protein its abilities. So it might have a site here, which had a particular shape, which would interact with one kind of molecule, and it would have a different shape over here that might interact with another. And so it would bring these two molecules together, and so operate as an enzyme. So we gradually learn that the, the complex shape of proteins explains a lot of the symptoms that we have from genetic diseases. Okay, so we get to the Okay. Um, I've been given to understand quite authoritatively that human brains are not gender specific when we're born. So I was quite interested to see your diagram of the different the difference. Sorry, I'm struggling to oh. just speak up a bit then for me. Okay, I'll try. Um, I've been given to understand that there is no 
to check the bias at, uh, at the birth of a human uh, in the brain, they're all the same, but if they're male or female, so it's non-specific. So I was interest, interested to see your diagram of the differences between yeah. the is that, is that due to your plasticity or...? Yes, I think it's now generally accepted that different hominids had different mental capacities. Uh, and the Homo sapiens happened to come out of the top, as it were. I mean, one of the one of the problems about human evolution is what happened to the Neanderthals, who were quite like Homo sapiens and evolved in Europe. Of course, they didn't evolve in Africa, and yet they've entirely disappeared. But they seem to have had some interbreeding because we've all got about three percent of uh, of DNA from uh, the Neanderthals. Uh, but the differences in the brains of, of different kinds of hominids remains really quite interesting and puzzling. Now I'm talking about male versus female. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't catch sorry, that. Sorry, yes, I wasn't yes. I'm not very young. I think that's... I it's whether we're born with the same brain. Yes. So they're all, they're all just exactly the same at birth. And, and we evolve into this gender specific. That's right. I think it's assumed that it's partly at least a result of the exposure of the brain to a different suite of hormones. Since men and women secrete different hormones because of their sex, it means that our brains are exposed to a slightly different hormonal environment. Um, but it, I think it, it remains a, a, an aspect of great interest because. It's clear that men and women have different, that there are different things that men and women are good at and not so good at. Uh, and I think we still live in a society that is exploring uh, the abilities of women. We've tended to suppress women. I think one of the genetic tendencies of men is they try to dominate the other sex. And I don't know where that comes from, but it seems a very common aspect of human activity. <coughs> And so I think we're still exploring uh, the abilities that women have. And we live in an age where I think that's unfortunately <coughs> becoming no more evident. I mean, they take our roles now as, uh, say, musical conductors. At one time, there were almost no women musical conductors. They were almost all men. Uh, so the balance, I think, is going to be uh, changed in the future. But it, it's, I mean, it's quite difficult to know what we can do to, to advance that. Okay, um, yeah, we come to Roger, and then thank you for that, and then the gentleman that we have to I think it's only, I think it's very clear that one can have an experience, and that experience, whatever it may be, will cause neurons to connect or synapses to fire. But how do they come back in? How does the memory actually release that thing? I think that's not at all clear. As I try to emphasize, that what is committed to memory and what is not seems to be almost random. And if we have a, an experience that does become embedded in our memory, of course it affects us in the future much more as we recall uh, what happened. And, and it's very variable about how long lasting a particular memory is. So some people still remember what happened to them when they were three or four years old in their prime. Uh, and other people can't remember anything until they were about seven. So the, the responses to life and to the environment around them is very variable. The gentleman in the black there, so I don't know your name. Brian. Oh, um, can you differentiate between the brain and the mind? <laughs> well, not really. I would say that, I mean, the mind is the brain at work, and it is the, the kind of philosophic uh, aspect of brain function. And so we say that the human mind uh, is something that exists, but it only exists in our imagination. And so it, it's all a function of our brain. Um, the 
words are quite difficult to differentiate from the I'm going to have a have a uh, Just that, that leads on to um, a question that I've got more. In the week, I received an email from someone um, that um, was inviting me to listen to a lot of podcasts on uh, the subject of that or the hypothesis that our consciousness may be somewhere else in the universe, not actually in the brain. And some people are saying that the brain is like a receiver. Now, my instinct is to say that this must be complete nonsense, but I wondered if you had a, a, a scientific uh, way of explaining that. Well, I'm not explaining it, but, but a scientific response to that idea that the mind might be somewhere else and the brain is just like a, a receiver. Yes, I've heard people quite often say that. Um, I, I think it's uh, that people, we all naturally, as humans, I think, have a tendency to fantasize. And so the idea that our brain might be somewhere else, or that our mind might be somewhere else, that is a projection of what's happening in our brain, I think is, is simply a, a fanciful notion. I think the mind is simply our brain at work, and our brain is in our skull, isn't anywhere else. Um, our abilities to, I mean, it's very interesting to look at things like telepathy, about whether humans can communicate with one another other than by speech or sight or whatever. Uh, at one stage in my life, I started going to spiritualist meetings out of curiosity. And some of the evidence there looked very like telepathy, as if the media knew what other people were thinking. And I remember the medium said to me that she thought I was very hostile and I was very skeptical about the whole thing. I don't know why she would go there. Maybe she lets you off on you. Can you ask a question? You know, you were saying that the mind and brain, you know, and people are projecting the mind is out of the brain, but when you focus that when you sleep and awake, when you're sleeping, the mind is still working, I mean, yeah. the brain is still working. Yeah. Our breathing. Example of breathing. Yeah, sure. Self conscious, self consciously, you know, whether we're talking, whether we're sleeping, the breathing is going on. Yeah? So there's something in the brain which controls the breathing. Right? Yes, yes, yes. In fact, we use the reptilian method where they say our brain or the reptilian method where, I mean, in case of fear, anxiety, anger, you know, we cocoon or we get self defense and cortisol on those eyes. Yeah. You know, we do all the bits and pieces. Now, if you're not being that scenario, you'll never have experience. But the brain, it's such fundamental that you can experience that kind of yes. emotion. Yes. So, you know, like people are saying things, but you know, we don't have the proof yet. But it's more bigger than that, isn't it? Yes, I think that's right. I think that, especially in sleep, our brain seems to be able to generate ideas mm -hmm. that have not been part of our conscious life. Yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of creativity. So there's just you've got like a conscious and subconscious mind playing together in the brain. Yeah. So it's yeah. through the, the proteins, the, the, the blood, the detox to your body. So it's like you have a motorway. Uh, instead of having one way, you have a four-way motorway. Yeah. And cars are moving up. Yeah. Something like that. That's the flow which I feel. That's why I enjoy playing because it's, it's, it, it's so... Because my you know, I, I work for like a scatter, part of the I look up the adventure and of my people. Oh, yes. I've seen scenarios where a residence, one minute she's fine, next minute she's laughing. Yeah. So in the mind, if you say the brain, it's such fundamental. Oh, just excuse me, sorry, I'll the clock there now. Sorry, the, 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 the brain is so fundamental that we don't know what it's thinking. Yeah. At this moment in time, I could be thinking something, I'm talking to you something, but my mind could be thinking yeah, something else. Right. Yeah. So I've seen residents who are talking to you one minute, and then the next minute they're stopping. Yes. And third minute is, oh, no, I miss my daughter. And yet, you know, she lost her daughter like 50 years or 60 years ago. And she can remember that minute detail, yeah. how the daughter was dressed, because something triggered her mind, a music, a play, or a show. Yeah. I think that's exactly like, right. I mean, our brain, in some ways, has a life of its own, yes. which we're not in control of. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.
So, can I just ask, so how did anyone manage to look at a person's brain with, by, by the next screen vision, whatever, yeah. before they were converted, then after we actually physically compare, that's what I'm interested in. You said about um, identical twins, no one's actually had two identical twins, have they, that died, and compared their brains or have they? I don't know. You mean that the, the relationship between the brains of identical twins? Well, both things. When someone managed to actually look at the brain of someone before they converted, and then afterwards, oh, yes. they have actually had ancient changes. Yes, I'm after. sure that's right. I'm sure there are profound changes before and after a religious conversion. So, with identical twins, has someone had two identical twins that died and compared their brain? Just yes, I think, that, I think that's happened. Oh. There's been a lot of. There was a guy. Uh, from Tom Bushart, who worked in Minnesota, and they had a huge study of identical twins, whom they found in the States. Many of these people were adults, but were, and, um, believed they had a twin somewhere, and his lab would often find the other person and look at how they had developed differently, despite the fact that they were genetically identical. Um, so we can learn a lot by looking at identical twins real and separately. Uh, which is what I'm going to try to do. And I'm sure if, if you look at the identical twins very simple, you find differences in their brain uh, imposed by their environmental experience. And of course, there's, there's an immune aspect to this. So if you have two identical twins, and when one of them is five years old, they encounter an influenza virus, which maybe gives them a neurological condition. But the other one doesn't. You know, from day one, although they are genetically identical, there are differences of experience. And the immune system, of course, changes in us in response to the viruses and bacteria we encounter. And so identical twins are only identical on day one. They eventually will differentiate. Okay, let's go to the Okay. Uh, to go back to the sexuality point that you brought up about the brain being gender neutral at birth, yeah. so how would you suggest about uh, transsexuals and cross-gender where they believe that they were born into the wrong body? Right? Because the brain would have been correct at the time of creation, um, and then you're suggesting that the hormones would have influenced the sex and gender of the person. So that when they get to old enough to say, I'm the wrong sex, yeah. that they don't want to do that. Well, I don't know whether, it's very difficult to explain. Uh, some people seem to become aware at a very young age that their outward physique is not the persona, so it's the wrong sex. I mean, someone like Jan Morris, she claims that when she was very young, I think five years old, she thought of herself being a different sex from the one that she was. Uh, and of course she eventually married and she stayed with the same partner all her life. But uh, at one, for, some, for some years, Jen Norris had a, an office in Oxford and she lived with this woman in Wales. And she was a man in Oxford and she was a woman in Wales. And she, she found, you know, that actually life was different in the two places. You <laughs> started off by saying that we can't remember everything because we have such an overload, yes. which obviously I can understand. When we sleep, do we do a sort of shifting? You know, the firing system. Then. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the assumption that our brains are not inactive during sleep. And so there is some uh, selection during sleep of what we're going to remember. Yes, and have we got little files, so to speak, in our mind? Because if we want to think of, say, the 60s, we can zoom into memories from that period yes. of time. Yes. And we're not crowded out to it thoughts about the 80s or whatever. You know, we can focus on that period. Yes. 
I agree. I think it's still very puzzling how we can use, recall, and choose a full medal, I can recall, how we can choose a full medal in our memories of a particular place or a particular time and recover those, even if we haven't had that thought for the past 10 or 20 years. Yes. Um, so I think memory still has a lot of curiosity. And I know um, when my the last few months of my husband's life were pretty dreadful. And when I, something triggers it, and I start thinking about it, I think, no, I'm going to stop now because that's too painful. Yes. And somehow or other, I can make my mind stop at a certain point and not go on to the rest. Not always, yes. but I can do it. And, and that's so interesting, isn't it? There's another aberration which is related to that. My wife is a GP, and she had a few patients who would lose their spirals. And then a week or two afterwards, they'd come to see her and say, I keep seeing my spirals, I keep meeting them in the house. And so we seem to hallucinate in that way if we lost someone who was very close to us. So we keep replacing the, the memory with what appears to be a reality. Uh, 
I mean, it's, it's thought to be slightly inherited, and that you find that left-handedness is rarer than right-handedness, and that there's a tendency for left-handedness to be slightly inherited. And you're often at an advantage, I think, if you're left-handed, because most people are right-handed. And they're more used to doing things or playing with left-handed people, whereas you get more used to playing with right-handed people. So you're at a slight advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Another one from me. Would it be feasible or even possible for a humanist brain to show a larger logical part of the brain as opposed to a religious person who might have more imaginative part of the brain. Is that something that we if, if we were allowed to do that experiment, do you think we'd see anything? Yes, I mean, I, I think that we are very cheery about interfering with people's conscious behaviour and with what their brain tells them to do. But I would have thought that in the future it may well be, become the norm for people to undergo treatment to enable them to have abilities which they wouldn't all otherwise have. You know, if we understood more about the inheritance of musicality, then we could train our children to become much more musical than they would otherwise do. But on the whole, we just don't understand how to do that at all. They Say a little about intelligence and uh, perhaps inheritability of intelligence, etc. Yeah, it's actually been studied quite a lot, as you probably know, with, with, uh, with uh, identical twins real separately. Uh, of course, there are often a lot of caveats about to what extent IQ tests are reliable, but I, uh, we don't have anything better at the moment. And certainly if you use IQ tests as, as a source of information about intelligence, uh, it appears that intelligence is about 70% inherited and 30% uh, uh, environmental. Uh, I mean, uh, our society is very complex, so the school you go to and the friends you have, to some extent, are determined by your IQ. But your IQ is also going to be, be changed by the, the friends you have, isn't it? So it's kind of two-way traffic. Uh, but it looks as if um, inheritance is much more important than in the, in the environment, in the population of IQ. Which really has all kinds of important things to say about school education. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that I think schools should be much more open-minded about the abilities of their children. I mean, it's also true. We, we tend to, I mean, England is a very class structured society. And we used to think that people with more money were, were smarter and more intelligent than the people who had very little money. But that's almost certainly nonsense. There are a lot of poor people who've never had an opportunity to express themselves intellectually who almost certainly have a high IQ. And I think that is still, we still haven't sorted that all out. So I think we should try to afford opportunity to people, irrespective of their, the class that they come from. Uh, I just want to share this, uh, something about IQ, um, because I'm dyslexic, so, if you were to give me an IQ test, yeah. I probably would not do very well. So, but I have had screening done, so they do a different kind of test to test the IQ. Yeah. But according to that, I have a higher IQ. Yeah. Um, but I also play chess, so that's a lot to do with pattern recognition oh, yeah. and so forth. And I don't know exactly how, how it is, but I think I'm sort of ranked sort of uh, 75% above uh, uh, most people. So uh, it within the 25%. Um, um. Yes, people who join Mensa, for example, are often very interested in their own IQ. Um, and I, I have no idea whether the membership of Mensa is, is an accurate indicator of people's IQ or not. But 
IQ tests, I think, are very difficult to, to it's very difficult to ensure that IQ tests are valid for everybody. I remember with one IQ test, when they tested Eskimo children, the children of the Inuit, they were very good at uh, orientation. Uh, and it's assumed that because in winter they had to learn to navigate in a world that was entirely white. And so they, they developed, uh, they had a highly developed sense of perspective and navigation and so on. And that appeared in their ability when they sat in IQ tests. Uh, it, you know, I have to say that I don't know very much about the topic of IQ tests. So I imagine that they're not a very representative uh, indicator of uh, intelligence and so on. Yeah, but uh, a lot of um, corporations, they use IQ tests to uh, source their staff. And, yes. Um, so, yeah, so. Yes, it comes and goes, isn't it? I mean, it's related to Sounds like the 11 plus, and about whether that was a good idea or not, whether you can actually predict a young person's abilities uh, when they are when they're 11. And of course, sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. There are any number of very talented people out there who failed in 11 plus, but actually succeeded very well afterwards. <laughs> There is one thing that you've mentioned several times that's considerably worried me. How many pairs of identical twins are there who've been separated at birth and contributed to um, this research? I would hope it's a small number. It is a small number. I think the Minnesota study initially was based on 64 pairs of different ages. Uh, if you look up uh, on your computer under the title of Minnesota Twin Studies, you'll find quite a lot of the information that they've come up with. Um, and it's, it, it, it is very, very interesting to see that, I mean, it, what is particularly interesting is to see people who've been separated at or soon after birth, <coughs> reared in very different backgrounds, and then see them as adults. And uh, I knew Tom Bouchard slightly, and we often sometimes thought of publishing together because I was very interested in the genetics of identical twins. And if, if you look at, <laughs> at these aspects, you find that, uh, that often the adults who the rear separately still have remarkable traits of similarity. If you sit them both down in chairs so and they haven't met one another for maybe 45 years, but you immediately notice that they still run their nose in the same way or they still have the same habit. You know, so there are things that you wouldn't expect to be inherited that nonetheless are perceivable in identical twin children separately. I and mean, it's quite curious to see these things. Sorry, could you go to Paul? Paul here. Paul Beckett. And then I think we'll be wrapping up if anyone's got any. There's one aspect that I find um, I have an opinion on, which is probably wrong, but people say, oh, that guy, he's, he's an intelligent chap, he's an MA, he's got all these degrees. I don't interpret that as intelligence. I interpret that as an academic, right? But to be an academic, you need a very, very good memory. So if you can remember everything you talk, you pass every exam, oh, yeah. you get great yeah. qualifications. Yeah. But give that person something he hasn't been taught, and can he work out how to do it? That is what I call intelligence. I, I, I'm reminded of one of the quotations from Shakespeare, where he said uh, that, uh, no, what does the quote go? That, um, that if life is taken of the flood, it will lead on to fortune. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. If you grasp a situation sometimes, when it happens to you, it can make a huge difference to your future. Uh, it all depends on which way you jump when you have that early experience in life. <coughs> and I mean, that's your invariant method. I think that's true. That the way you perform often in, in a situation of choice can have 
profound implications for your future life. I mean, nothing is more important, I suppose, in life than the person you end up with. And people make mistakes, don't they? And then after a year, they think, bloody hell, oh, why did I do this? Um, so that's one of them. Thank you.